Okay. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, a project that uh, Brendan, David, and I uh, worked on. Um, it's called Behavioral Muriology. And muriology is the fancy name for parts of things. So uh, parts of holes, maybe. Um, and the idea of behavioral muriology is that instead of looking at, say, physical parts, um, we're going to look at parts that you can understand based on how things are behaving. And our, our contribution is really going to be making this modal logic for talking about how constraints on some parts of a system can be passed along to other parts of that, that system. So we started thinking about this because uh, we were asking the sort of philosophical question of what does it mean to be a thing? Um, and so while uh, I believe our results can end up having more prosaic uses, I still can't help myself and I have to start the talk this way because this is what we were interested in. We didn't end up solving this question, but it led us to this, uh, this kind of, I think, fun mathematics. So if we have a cup, so any physical thing, then we can move it uh, by moving the handle. So I have this cup here, I can pick up the handle, and by just constraining the handle, I can put a constraint on the position of the whole thing. So I constrain the position of the handle to be here, and it has to be sort of nearby. And so one way to see this is it's because they are part of the same thing that the cup comes with the handle. So this is sort of our folk theory of things. Because they're part of the same thing, we can move the cup by just moving the handle. That's the good thing about the handle. Um, and we can turn this on the head, on its head. We can say that the fact that the cup does come with the handle is evidence for the fact that they are part of the same thing. And so the motto here is if you pull on part of a thing, the rest comes with it. And this is sort of what we were looking to formalize. So the first thing we have to do is sort of get rid of this physical idea and this idea that you're going to reach into the system and grab it and change it. Instead, we want to sort of have our model be a closed box and look at how the things in this box might be. And the reason we would be interested in this question is because um, you know, usually you have an ontology, a theory of things in mind when you're designing a model. Um, and it's not clear a priori that after you've built the model, the things in the model that the model says are there were the things you thought about to put in. So it'd be really nice if we could get the things back out of the model, because uh, maybe we'd be surprised. Um, we might find different kind of uh, coherent concepts lurking within our models that we didn't even put in. So the way we get out of the physical um, intuition is by talking instead of about pulling, we'd say satisfying a constraint. And we mean that in the sort of usual sense as being there's just some property of the system and satisfying, which we call the constraint. And satisfying that property is what it means to satisfy this constraint. So if one part of the system is constrained, then the rest of that system will be somehow constrained. And so we have a handle, it's sitting at a certain position. And therefore, if I know that, I know the cup has to be nearby. So the way we're thinking about things are, they are sort of the objectification of the passing of constraints among parts of a system. So we didn't end up with a theory of things, but we did end up with a theory of passing constraints. So that's what I'm gonna talk about now. So uh, behavioral muriology is the, uh, the, the title of the work here. And muriology is the study of parthood. So murio um, means, part or some some root from somewhere is part and logi being you know study and so what we're going to model a system uh, uh, as is something which has a set or generally an object in a topo so uh, yesterday we saw um, a talk on um, sheaves uh, in sheaves and um, I'm sorry I'm, I'm totally blanking on who just gave that talk so if, if speakers in the audience and wants to call me out then please do um, and so this would also work in that uh, other category because it's also a topos. Um, but uh, if what I just said was, was gibberish, 
we'll think of it as a set of behaviors or a set of if if the behaviors are only static in time, we might call them states, but I'm going to call them behaviors. And so the thing to notice is that if we know the behavior of a whole system, we can see how any part of the system is behaving at the same time. So that gives us this restriction function from behaviors of the whole system to behaviors of the part. And we're going to ask that this restriction function is this rejection. And the reason is because we don't want to consider the part as a system in its own right. We only want to know what it's be, how it's behaving as a part of the whole system. So we only want to look at if, if, we, if maybe it has a lot of possible behaviors, but we only look at the ones that are possible in the whole system, given the way it's placed in there. So a very simple example here, and I know this is going to, I think my conventions here might upset the physicists, but is if we have a pair of particles in the plane and they have position P and momentum Q, I'm sorry, um, then the state space here would be uh, pairs of, uh, so if we had two particles, uh, P1 and P, uh, particle one, particle two, then the state space would be this uh, space of pairs of their two coordinates. And the first particle here we'll see as the first projection, that is, it's a surjection. And so that's going to be our part. So we have a two particle system and we see the part of it as this projection. So the question we're trying to answer is here is how does the behavior of one part or constraints on the behavior of one part constrain other parts of the system. So how are constraints passed? And so here's an example of where we would get such a system. So if you saw my talk on Tuesday, I used the same example there. Um, uh, here's a, a, a simple dynamical system and it involves two sorts of entities, foxes and rabbits. And this is called the luck of Altera predator prey model. It's not really important about the specific model. Um, and I probably should have used the SIR model because uh, epidemiology is on all of our minds. Um, but again, here we, uh, the constraint passing problem has an interesting flavor, which we might call the control problem, which is suppose I, I want to keep the rabbits in check. So I'm tasked with making sure that the rabbit population satisfies a certain predicate, which I'll call in check. So the question is, how do I constrain the fox population? Maybe I have to introduce some foxes in order to keep the rabbit population in check. And when is too much? Right? So this idea that, that the constraints we might put on, on foxes would then constrain rabbits because they have this interlocking in the system is constraint passing in this general system. And so specific, specifically how we would do this is we would take the behaviors of the whole system to be the solutions to this uh, system of equations um, and the behaviors of each separate population to be their, the part. Um, so they're going to be the, tra the, the, the trajectories or the functions, the, the populations in time, which occur as the one part of this solution to the whole system. And so the projection is the projection out of that, that component. And so this is sort of how we, you can build these very freely um, uh, from various sorts of systems. And so what we're doing is giving a language in which to talk about these control problems and other things that involve constraint passing. Um, so I, I might say that if you have your own muriology in mind, you might functorially interpret it in this way, or you can just take a set of states and define the parts of it to be um, surjections out. Um, in any case, in this talk, I'm not going to really talk about the muriology too much, um, but safe to say you can define uh, union and intersection solely in terms of behaviors. Um, and it's given by, uh, by uh, an image factorization of the product and the pushout. So these nice things you can do in a topo suit. Um, again, if those, for, for whom those words are sensible. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, come to our modal logic for constraint passing. So a constraint formally on a part is going to be a predicate on its set of behaviors. So it's just a, a predicate that tells us whether or not we're satisfying this constraint. And so if we have a constraint uh, phi on uh, Q and a constraint C on P, then we can ask how does C constrain Q and how does phi constrain P? So one thing to note is that sort of they, they interact a little bit. You can see that there's only some part of the whole state space, which is that blob there in the corner, um, that, uh, that, that satisfies both these constraints simultaneously. So if you know you satisfy one, you also know something about how you satisfy the other, but maybe not everything. Um, so 
I'm going to talk about two universal solutions to the question of how does phi constrain Q and how does, uh, sorry, how does C constrain Q and how does phi constrain P. So first of all, from the constraint phi, which is on Q, we can ask how does, how do we constrain P to ensure that Q will be doing phi? So if we have a constraint uh, phi, we're going to, we're going to produce one on P going backwards. And it's going to ensure that Q is satisfying this constraint. And so what we can do is say that, well, it will ensure it if every state of the whole system, which satisfies that constraint on P, um, sat, uh, um, if whenever you have a state of the whole system, which restricts to that uh, constraint on that behavior, I'm sorry, whenever you have a behavior of the whole system, which restricts to that behavior on P, then it satisfies, then Q, what Q is doing during that behavior satisfies phi. And duly, if we have this constraint C on P, we can ask what behaviors of Q does it allow? And so we'll say that it uh, allows a behavior B if there is a behavior of the whole system which restricts to it on, on uh, Q, Sorry, that's a typo. It should say Q. Um, and which on P satisfies that constraint. So these are sort of the two universal options. And, um, and the notation we have for these is sort of suggestive of the, the modalities. And I'll, I'll come back to that. So these are our two universal options. Um, and they are ways of passing across this span here. And if you're familiar with, um, with, with, with toposes and what you can do in them, these are, you'll know that from any map in a topos, you get a adjoint triple. And that adjoint triple is given by, um, effectively in a way by a, a selection of, uh, of uh, a, a substitution of variables and an existential quantification or a universal quantification. And so what we're doing here is we're pulling back to the whole system and then pushing forward along one or the other of those, of those adjoints to, to the other part. And so we call these intermodal operators because they're very much like modal operators, which are used in logic to decorate, um, decorate propositions with ways that they can be true. But they're going between different parts of the system. So they're not uh, modal operators, which are usually considered to be uh, endofunctors, or in, in a sense, they're monads of an order. Um, instead, uh, they go between systems, but they function very much like modalities, and, and we can use them in logic like modalities. So for good measure, to express the statement um, that, we, that we need to keep the fox, that we need to set the fox population F to keep the rabbits in check, we would write this uh, modal statement here. Um, so uh, in check is a property of rabbits, but here we're applying box in check to foxes. And this will say that the population of foxes ensures that the rabbits are kept in check. Okay, so um, as, a, uh, as a property of this, um, and there are many properties this has, which I, I'm, I'm not gonna bore you with right now. Um, although looking at the time, maybe I should have. Uh, one, of the, one of the properties is that these are adjoint. And so we can see this in this picture here as sort of a non, uh, it's an example of it, but it's a negative example of it, which is that here, we don't have that C uh, implies the insurance of fee. And so conversely, we don't have that the allowance implies uh, of, of C implies fee. So one way to, to think of this adjointness is that if my left hand doing something ensures that my right hand is doing something else, then if what my right hand is doing allows my left hand to do that first thing, it must be doing that thing, vice versa. So if that sounded a little complicated, that's one of the nice things about, about writing down all these properties because you just sort of mechanize the, the process of thinking about how these constraints are passed. Um, and there are many other properties for example, concerning um, the relationship of these modalities and unions and intersections of parts. 
and how they can be calculated separately. And uh, from them, you can recover the relation of parthood. So if you know that everything, so if you, if you know in the sense that uh, every behavior on one part is, ensures a specific behavior of another part, then, then you also know that there must be directly a part of it. Because uh, that, and that's in, in a sense what makes this muriology behavioral. Because if one part's behavior is totally determines the behavior of another part, we just say it is a part. Um, and so uh, going back to um, this idea that these are sort of uh, modalities is um, we can recover the classic uh, alethic modalities of possibility and necessity um, as special cases of our intermodalities. So Kripke um, gave the first possible world semantics of of modality of uh, these modalities, possibility and necessity. And it works like this. You have a set of possible worlds of which you imagine that the actual world is just one element. And then you have a relation on it, um, which it's not generally assumed to be uh, an equivalence relation, but here I will assume it's a, an equivalence relation. Um, and that relation is called accessibility. And uh, I don't really know how the philosophers think about this, but it just says sort of that if you're in one world and you can talk about the other accessible worlds. So it makes sense. They're not too far off from your, the way you're talking so that what is, po what is possible there has any bearing at all on what's happening here. So if you have this, you also have a quotient map and then we can get uh, Kripke's uh, semantics for these modalities as uh, passing back and forward by the intermodalities. So a great case of this is if the equivalence relation, everything's accessible from everything else. And then you can see that um, being possible in a possible world here means in the sense that there is a world which satisfies this predicate, or in other words, um, in, in our terms, there's a behavior that satisfies the constraint. So the constraint must be possible. On the other hand, uh, for necessity, what we can say is that every behavior satisfies the constraint if it satisfies this. And one way of saying that is truth ensures your behavior. And since truth is always happening, your behavior is always ensured. So it's sure, it's necessary. Um, and th th that's, all I, uh, that's all I really have. Um, I can talk more about more properties. Um, I cut them for time, but probably shouldn't have. So thank you. Thanks very much. That's great. I don't think anyone will complain about a talk being a slightly too short. Uh, I've never heard anyone complain. Uh, is that a question you have there, Brendan? Or are you still using that hand for applause? Maybe I should stop using that. Yeah, it's confusing to the poor old moderator. So anyway, if there are questions, uh, you could just ask them. Zinovi, ask a question. OK. Yes, yeah. Um, your situation when you have, say, two parts and some system uh, of which those two parts are projections mm -hmm. very much reminds me uh, the representation of symmetric lens by a span of asymmetric lenses. Interesting. So I believe that your, uh, yeah, it's, it's just symmetric lens for two parts or multi r symmetric lens for more than two parts. And then it's very fresh you because it seems nobody applied model logic to lens setting. Of course, in your case, you don't have just one put. You have all the space of all puts. It's so-called lenses with uncertainty. So it right. should be very interesting connection. Right? Yeah, that sounds very interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. Yeah. yeah this could be. Yeah, sorry, go on. I can, I can yeah. see that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, any other, I, I'm any other questions? Someone posted a link to some document just now. I don't know what it is. Uh, I have a question. Oh, I should mention yes. there's also a very nice yes, yes please. Um, have you have you thought about so so sort of the bane of of systems theorists' existence is is the parity bit system, where you have like n parts and they're constrained so that they're the the parity is is even right and so in in the parity bit system um uh if you look if n is larger than two 
and you look at any two bits, um, they do not constrain each other at all because there, there are systems. So there are yes. constraints that are only visible at, at the highest scale. Um, and, and specifically, like, so, I mean, you could say that, okay, if we look at half of the bits, then half of the bits constrain the other half of the bits, but it's a bit clunky to have to like choose a splitting of the bits and, and sort of tensor sub sub part. So is there, have you thought about um, looking at constraints, not just between two systems, but between n, n subsystems? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, we, while our intermodalities are going between two systems, um, I, I think it like, it's, it's definitely interesting to think about multiple parts at the same time. And uh, so there, we have sort of union and intersection of these parts. And that's one way we can bring them, get multiple ones of them together at the same time. So uh, for example, you can, you can express the idea that of these two, the two bit systems separating in this, in this logical way so that, for example, you can characterize when it, when, when one part is a product projection using the behavioral mirrorology, it's sort of like a disjointness condition. Um, but I'm not sure that answered your question. Um, I mean, doesn't have to be answered. Just, just, just wondering what your thoughts were. So. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll, have to think about this more. We have a lot of more legs the merrier is what David says in the chat. So <laughs> um, I'd like to point everyone to uh, a, a nice um, blog post on the N Category Cafe by uh, uh, Toby and Bruno. So yeah, you can see that in the group chat. If you if for those of you who aren't already looking at that. Um, I don't know if Zenovi is asking another question or if that's a residual raised hand. I can make, I can have the power to lower people's hands for them now. This is great. I wish I could do this in like an order. So uh, any other I, questions? I think I see a question in the chat. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So a part, this is sort of the big thing here is that what we treat a part is exactly dual to what is kind of normally thought, normally you would think it's a sub-object, it's something that goes into your whole system, something like a monomorphism. But we say, no, if you're looking at the behaviors of your system, how it actually behaves, then a part should be a surjection out of your system. Or another way to think of it is you ask for the equivalence relation given by setting things equal, if they're equal, if the way that they're behave, that, like behaviors of everything, you set them equal if they're equal, doing the same thing on this one little part. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just interrupt and say that that's sort of the attitude in classical mechanics for this same reason. So, like the space of states of a two-part system is the product of, of the two in the simplest case, and then you can project down onto each part. Uh, yeah. So it's a kind of dual attitude. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think it's the key idea, it's a cool idea that part is a projection out of the system, right? Right. So Clemens has a question. Hi, sorry. Um, just wanted to know, shouldn't there be somehow the function from the behavior of the whole system to, this, to the subsystem, shouldn't it be a relation rather than a function? Uh, so... We, we take the point of view that if you know the whole behavior of the whole system, then that includes the behaviors of its parts. So you can sort of like directly functionally extract the behavior of the part. Um, okay, but somehow I have the feeling you could imagine a situation where that would be just a relation and not. Uh, yes, you, yeah, you can, um, I mean, if you, if you want to do this in sort of any index category where the pole, the, it re indexing has left and right adjoints, uh, you totally can. So, um, I mean, not all the theorems will remain true, which I didn't present, but, <laughs> but um, you know, the, but the basic setup it can be done at that, okay. at that scale, so. Thanks. So just so people know what's going on. So I guess the next talk starts at 
10 after. So if people want to sneak away to get more coffee or less coffee, they can uh, do it now. Uh, but Chris has a qu question uh, that he's typed in. He yeah. says, have you explored, maybe read it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you explored using these intermodality conditions around interoperability in system requirements? Uh, the answer is, is no, but that sounds wonderful and exactly like the kind of thing uh, I would like to explore, so. Um, can I also ask a question, not to keep you from a, a break or anything. <laughs> um, I'm curious if, if you've considered or looked into um, temporal modalities, because here you've shown, of course, a simple picture of an instant sort of thing. And, and I see here a temporal type theory, but it's 200 pages and I'm not fluent, so I couldn't just browse through it. So um, yeah. Yeah, uh, so um, I guess uh, we were originally going to do this in the temporal topos of that temporal type theory in order that the ambient logic would also have all these temporal modalities. And, mm -hmm. uh, and David can speak to that a lot, a lot better than, than I can. Um, but eventually we decided that the, the crux of the idea was really um, uh, did not need that extra stuff to, to, uh, to do. Although we, sure. we, we definitely were thinking of that in mind because often constraints are passed over a delay in time and you want to express that. Um, Cool. Thank you. Thank you. So if you do it in a general topos, then you have all those abilities if you want them. Okay, cool. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think I'm going to sneak off for a, a minute and be back. So I'll, I'll, I'll let the rest of you take care of yourselves for a minute. Hi, David. Um, Hi. I, I have a question. Um, that's Valeria. Um, you see, the thing that is bothering me a bit is the fact that, you know, this kind of modality here is very classical. Mm -hmm. We have only one accessibility relation, which is kind of uh, traditionally S5. And, you know, I'd kind of hoped that things would be more constructive. And so that you would have two different accessibility relations. Uh, so I'm kind of you know, really one corresponding to implication and one corresponding to the modality itself. Oh, interesting. I'm not really familiar with, uh, Do you see what I mean? with the state of the art on the traditional like alethic modal logic. Um, nope. Or maybe I don't see what you mean. Stupid thing. Uh, Hi. Area? Hi. Uh, I have a question. Is this Sorry up? about that. My Sorry. my uh, internet failed completely. Um, did you hear my yes, my I, worry? I, uh, I think I did, but I'm not sure. I, uh, I so I'm not I'm not sure about this multiple accessibility. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, nor on sort of like what's new in the world of of semantics for modal logic in the in the philosophical side. That's right. Um, Okay. Uh, yes, I think maybe we can take it offline. I'll That'd show you yeah, some you. stuff about it because um, it, it's about classical modal logic versus intuitionistic or constructive modal logic. Oh, this is all intuitionistic. I don't know if that's, I mean, everything we that did. That is, is the problem because, you know, normally constructive or intuitionistic modal logic should have two accessibility relations, one dealing with the implication and one dealing with the modality itself. And, and they should interrelate somehow. So it's, I mean, at least that's the traditionally traditional way that people do it. Okay, I will, well, I would love Howard. to hear about that. I'm always, I'm always down to hear uh, a new wrinkle in, in intuitionistic logic, so. Um, Super, yeah. I'll, I'll send you some stuff. Thank you.